So what's the rest of the group up to? Well, Cassie is freaking out. She keeps hearing calls for help in the middle of the night, keeps seeing visions of a domed forest under the ocean. This is, of course, Axe, still trapped in the dome ship. But what's odd is, wasn't Cassie able to pick up his distress signals before because of her morphing abilities? How is she doing it now? We get some chapters of Axe trying to stave off some extreme cabin fever in the dome, and the longer he stays, the crazier he gets. The training dummies he sets up to practice tail combat with change shape when he isn't looking. Or maybe the dome ship is haunted! Ooh. Axe narrates. I had long since accepted the notion of solipistic conversation. It was part of a general psychological decay. On at least three occasions I had seen things that were almost certainly not real. Either that or the structure of time itself was different on Earth. Yeah, daylight savings messes up everyone, even aliens on the ocean floor. What I like about this is that it's one of the few anomalies we'll see that's origin is entirely clear. We don't know if Axe seeing things is because the timeline is breaking down, or because he actually is going fucking bonkers. We watch Axe be get his shark morph through a lot of trial and error with airlocks and force fields, but without someone to lead him, he doesn't feel he can really do anything. Not until the Yerks are at his front door and trying to destroy the dome. After tearing through a crap ton of taxons, because, come on, they're taxons, X makes his way to the shore and begins investigating Earth. Meanwhile, Marco is flirting with Rachel in a museum. Marco narrates. You know, girls love a guy with a sense of humor. Yeah, if he's Leonardo DiCaprio. Adam Sandler, not so much. Despite myself, I laughed. She could throw it back at me. I like that. Still, we should go out, do a movie, eat some burgers. I can make you laugh. Actually, I think the mere memory of that suggestion will supply me with plenty of laughter. She was fast. Sharper than I thought. I'd always assumed she was just a total babe, but she was cool. Funny. Wow, fantastic looks and she was funny? How often does that happen? You know, I could supply references, Rachel. Plenty of females have enjoyed the company of Marco the Magnificent. Females? What species? Yeah, I'm pretty much shipping Rachel and Marco forever and ever. However, things take a turn for the huh? when Marco spots what is clearly his mother in a stupid blonde wig. She appears to be clueless as to how she got there. Marco, in complete shock, calls out to her and Visor One tries to book it as quickly as she can. Marco gives chase, as does Rachel, even though she has no idea what's going on. Rachel narrates. I don't know why I ran after Marco, but I did. He was chasing a woman he couldn't possibly be chasing. Maybe I wanted to help him. But that's not what it felt like. It felt like... I don't know. Like I liked chasing someone. That's dumb, but it may be the truth. Marco and Rachel chase Visitor 1 into an alley, but she has some cronies she can call on, and they all start firing Dracon beams on the two kids, forcing them to retreat up a fire escape. And what of Axe? Well, he's in a loony bin. It's a wonder the Animorphs were able to keep him from the guys in white coats in their regular reality. Yeah, Axe has gained a human morph and has been learning human culture through the institutionalized, which is a lot easier than you'd think since he can demorph around them and nobody will take their panicked rambling seriously. Hey, you look like the brother of the centaur that's been living in my brain! And yes, Axe is still food crazy, but it didn't pop his taste bud cherry on cinnamon buns in this reality, oh no. Axe narrates. Taste. And such tastes. Cigarette butts, bologna sandwiches, grape juice, Vaseline, and best of all, the indescribably vibrant, mind-altering, overwhelming taste of cookies. Especially the cookies formed by two thin, round black discs with a layer of adhesive white substance between. Someday I hope my fellow Andalites will be able to visit Earth and morph to human simply for the intense pleasure to be had from eating cookies with a mouth. So the question now is, does Axe bite into the Oreo hole or does he twist it apart and lick the frosting? Be careful, Axe. Blood has been spilt over this. After some weeks of thinking on it, Axe decides that, on his own, there's only one action he can take against the Yerks. Go into show business! Axe breaks into a television studio and broadcasts an image of himself over the evening news. 
At Jake's house, Tom rushes into his room, calls someone on the phone, and grabs a gun he had hidden. Jake narrates. A gun? Did Tom really have a gun? The idea made me sick. Who owned handguns? Criminals. Pathetic people who thought it would make them important. Nuts. Every time there's a gun tragedy, Michael Grant's Twitter account is basically that paragraph posted over and over and over again. Jake is seriously worried about Tom, so he hides in the back seat of Tom's car as he drives to the station. There, Jake witnesses Tom shoot a security guard with a Dracon beam, and, accidentally bringing attention to himself, he gets shot at by a couple of other controllers. Jake escapes unhurt and unidentified, and now is when the four surviving not-animorphs get together. For Cassie... This feels right, like a hole is being filled, though not entirely. Cassie narrates. How about this alien thing you saw on TV? Marco asked. What about it? He shrugged. What did it look like? I don't know, like a... Like a blue deer, I said. Only it had a kind of a human face and a long tail. Jake looked at me in surprise. You saw it on TV, too? No. I shook my head. No, I've never seen it, but I know that it has two eyes on top of his head, on these little stalks. No one moved. The three of them just stared at me. And I'll tell you something else. He should be here. I pointed to a spot off to one side. My arm was goosebumped all the way up and down. He should be standing right there. To everyone else, it all seems like crazy talk, but to the reader, well, this is Cassie, so it all seems like crazy talk, but it's clear that Cassie is somehow aware of details from the normal timeline somehow. Despite not having morphing powers, these four kids are now a team, so they decide to snoop around Tom's stuff. Jake narrates. Careful. Watch for any kind of little telltales you might leave, Marco said. What are you talking about? You might place a hair in a certain way, say, wedged into a drawer to see if it's been opened. I stared at my friend. What do you know about this? He grinned. I read, man. You know, books. John le Carre. Tradecraft, dude. It's all about tradecraft. I was going to ignore him. Then I saw the hair. It was wedged into the closet door so that if the door was opened, it would fall. Now I've got this great mental image of a Yerk reading the spy who came in from the cold and going, Whoa! Wait till I tell the other guys about this! Jake and Marco can't find anything, but at this moment, Axe makes another broadcast, this time on all the channels, and now he's giving the Cliff Notes version of the Yerk invasion. Still not entirely sure how microphones pick up thought speak, but whatever. The broadcast gets cut off, and Tom shows up at this point, and he means business. He's done with a charade. He rounds up the boys, but Rachel comes in to save the day, swinging a fucking baseball bat. Just call me Babe Ruth, shithead! She basically cripples Tom, and the three of them make a run for it, but Vision 3 has pressed the let's get this show on the road button, and there are bug fighters flying around now. One of them blasts at the fleeing trio, and after a horrible explosion, Marco is dead. Okay. So the Yerk invasion is gradually revving up to full force, and Jake, Rachel, and Cassie keep mobile in order to avoid capture. Axe, still on his own, recognizes this as a possible tactical advantage, as a full-scale military operation might bring the attention of the Yerk fleet to Earth. And thanks to Visitor 3's poor management skills, there are so many Yerks here that an Andalite victory for Earth could effectively end the whole war. Axe needs to contact the Andalite fleet to alert them, and the best Z-Space communicator he might be able to get his hands on is on the blade ship that's just landed on the roof of the mall. The same mall where Jake, Rachel, and Cassie are currently hiding. hork start pouring into the mall to round up people for hosts. The three kids had managed to grab some Dracon beams earlier and are now using them to keep the Yerks off them as they try to escape. But it's not enough. Cassie narrates. The escalator deposited us in a heap on the landing. Jake jumped up. The remaining hork loomed over us. Jake looked so small, so weak. There was nothing he could do. The monster was going to take us, infest us. The Yerk Pool, that dark cavern, that hellish place. I saw it in my mind, 
but I had never seen it. Why? I asked the creature as he loomed over us. Yes, Cassie, because clearly the aggressive giant lizard alien will take the time to answer your questions. Would you like it in writing, too? Yes, even in alternate realities, Cassie is a moron. Axe shows up to save the day, decapitating the hork Bajir before he can give his long-winded monologue to answer Cassie's question. The three kids latch onto Axe, though Axe is pretty confused because he, she has no idea who these three people are. Cassie narrates. That's when Rachel steps swiftly behind one of the hork Bajir. She was carrying the head, the bladed hork Bajir head. She lifted it high and slammed it down, blades out. She buried the hork Bajir's head blades into his comrade. God damn it, Rachel. If violence is an art, you are fucking Caravaggio. Which is to say you like to poke your fingers into open wounds. Da-da-da-da-da, art joke. Axe and friends fight their way to the roof, but Rachel takes a hork Bajir blade to the gut, and now Rachel is dead. Okay. Jake narrates. Rachel! I cried. Cassie was screaming, screaming like she'd never stop. I grabbed Cassie, pulled her to me, dragged her with me, couldn't look back, couldn't see what had happened to my beautiful cousin. Choo! The antelite fired again and again. I saw a ray gun on the floor, clasped in a dead hand. I pried it free. I was holding Cassie by the hand, pulling her along with me. Choo! I felt the charge jolt my fingers. I let go of a hand that was no longer there. Cassie sizzled and disappeared, simply evaporated. And now Cassie is dead. Okay. Hey look, a time travel book where everyone dies but Jake. How's that for a plot twist? Does this mean Jake wins Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory? Jake and Axe manage to make it on board the Blade Ship. Visitor 3 is there. Visitor 3 is always there even in alternate realities, but he's shot and killed by... Cassie? But Cassie done got disintegrated. What's going on? Axe activates the blade ship, sends his message to the Antelite fleet, and then prepares to suicide bomb the Yerkpool ship in orbit. Then Marco shows up in Gorilla Morph, and by this point the Drode has had enough and puts a stop to this. He's clearly frustrated. The Drode and the Elemist appear on the bridge of the ship. Jake narrates. You cheated me, Elemist, the drode snapped. We had a deal, a trade-off. You were allowed to meddle with the timeline in the fall of Carrot situation, and we, my master Krayak and I, would be allowed to tempt this young jackal here. He stabbed a finger at me. I kept my bargain, the Elemist said. I have done nothing to bring about this result. The girl is an anomaly. She is sub-temporally grounded. You were careless. She's a freak of nature, the drode screamed. The Elemist nodded. Yes, she is. Marco said, What's going on here? He was no longer a gorilla. I'm pretty sure I was dead, then I'm a gorilla. Oh, I see it now, I see it now, the drode said, ignoring Marco, ignoring all of us. Subtle as always, Elemist. Your meddling came before, didn't it? How could we not have seen it? Alfango's brother, his time-shifted son, this anomalous girl here, and the son of Visa One's host body? A group of six supposedly random humans that contain those four? You stacked the deck! Did I? The Elemist laughed. That would have been very clever of me. Yeah, so Cassie is just randomly a time anomaly that will cause any alternate timelines to gradually break down, and Cassie will apparently always know that something is wrong. Sure, just like how she knew the timeline in Megamorphs number 3 with the uh, fascist America where people still had slaves wasn't right. Oh no, wait, no. She didn't know it was wrong. She didn't break down that timeline. In fact, this has never come up in any of the Animorphs time travel adventures. It's almost as if they just came up with this. So yes, this entire thing was a sneaky chess move from the Elemist, allowing him an advantage somewhere else in the universe while the Drode is forced to return things back to normal. Because in this timeline, sure, all the Animorphs die, and that sucks, 
But Earth is saved, and the Yerks lose the war. That's kind of a bummer, isn't it? If they hadn't gotten morphing powers, more people would have been saved? So the original timeline is returned, with Cassie being the only one to remember it. Jake narrates. Cassie nodded. But I'll say nothing about it. Tobias can't know that he might become a voluntary controller. And Jake can't know that he ever weakened enough to take the Drode's deal. What? What? What the fuck, Cassie? If you don't tell them, then nobody learns anything! First off, Tobias only became a voluntary controller under our new, vague definition of the term. But regardless, he'd probably be the first to admit that, yeah, he wasn't the strongest-willed kid back then, and he would brush it off. And Jake should know about how he accepted the Drode's deal as a warning in case the Drode or the Krayak try to pull something like this again. In fact, everyone should be aware of it because the Drode and the Krayak are going to pull something like this again! But even if you omit these two details, why not share what was learned? Discuss the strategic value of Axe's actions during all of this. Maybe consider that it's time to make the invasion public. It seemed to kind of work. If you don't tell them, Cassie, then what's the point of any of this? Stupid, stupid Cassie. Postbook follow-up. Let me start by saying that this is, by a slight margin, the best of the four Megamorphs books. Megamorphs number three is a lot of fun in a very stupid time travel way, but Megamorphs number four feels like the only one that actually contributes to the characters and lore of the larger Animorph series, and by extension is the only one of the four I say is a must read. And there is a lot of great stuff in there. The writing is among the best from Kay Applegate, and it's always nice to see her slash they back for a book. The characterizations are spot on, the alternate takes on familiar scenes give these moments a new life that helps revitalize some of the older books for rereads, and there's a ton of memorable events, from kick-ass moments like Rachel killing a hork with a decapitated hork head, to small character moments like Marco and Rachel flirting during the school field trip. Most of the problems for this book comes with the ending. There's this sudden and unasked-for shift that turns this animal story into an Elemis story, a big build-up to learn a lot of things we were already guessing about the Elemis. That he's an asshole. That he's sneaky and everything he does has an ulterior motive. That he treats the Animorphs as pawns in a cosmic chess game. And that any hints of being grandfatherly and sage-like is just the spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. We learn that he orchestrated things so that these specific kids became the Animorphs, but it's pretty clear that he's been weaving the threads of fate for a while now. And yeah, his ploy here is sneaky as shit, but it's no less dickish because it worked. The only really real new thing we learned from all this is that Cassie is some latent superpower related to time travel, which would have been a great payoff if anything had actually built up to it. The only previous event that relates to this time travel anomaly thing is that it allowed Cassie to hear Axe's distress call from the dome ship, which as far as retcons go isn't bad, but you'd think it would be more relevant to, you know, the time travel stories. Actually, Cassie having some kind of supernatural awareness of timelines might have gone a ways to justify certain actions in Megamorphs number 2. As unjustified as genocide is, I trust the word of Cassie the Time Lord more than Tobias the guy who read a dinosaur book once. Truthfully, the plot of making Cassie a time anomaly was to make her more important in this stack the death scheme the Elemis has going on. Without it, the drode would be all Elfangor's son, Elfangor's brother, Visor One's son, the Wonder Cousins, and, um, Cassie. You stacked the deck, Elemis. You slipped a three of clubs in there by accident, but you stacked the deck. So yeah, the reveal feels hollow. And with Cassie refusing to tell the rest of the Animorphs what happened in this timeline, a hollow reveal is all we can actually take away from this book. I guess we have to keep to the mandate that says Megamorph books have to be as irrelevant to the main series as possible. 
But it's not a bad book. It, it, it just doesn't quite stick the landing. If it somehow had, if the time anomaly stuff had been hinted at before, or if it had any lasting relevance, it would be among the all-time classics. As is, I give Megamorphs number four, back to before, a seven out of ten.